Is this everything that there is, or is there more? The physicist Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington said, The stuff of the world is mind stuff. And now, 50 years later, quantum physics is validating that statement. Our universe exists within our own consciousness. I'm Ron, and welcome to Simplest State, where we explore creativity and the expression of consciousness in the lives of our guests. Dr. Craig Pearson is a PhD in Vedic science. He also has a BA from Duke University, an MA in higher education administration, and a master's degree in writing. He has served as executive vice president of Maharshi International University and vice president of academic affairs. He is currently the special assistant to the president. Dr. Pearson has written two books, and his most recent book is the one that I'd like to speak about today. The book is called The Supreme Awakening, Experiences of Enlightenment Throughout Time and How You Can Cultivate Them. It's an honor to have you on this show, Craig, and thank you very, very much for being here. Great to be with you, Ron. Thank you for the invitation. There's many wonderful comments on this book um, from a variety of people, including multi-award winning film director David Lynch. And the wonderfully unique feature of this book is that it it documents in detail the experiences of higher (coughs) states of consciousness as they're described and written about by people across thousands of years, across all the geographic regions, and in virtually every culture. And it's not just from people who are in religious or spiritual studies or pursuits, but from a complete cross-section of society, including many people that all of us have heard of. Albert Einstein, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emily Dickinson, William Wordsworth, Master Eckhart, Lao Tzu, Billie Jean King, Marcus Aurelius, the poet Rumi, Jane Goodall, Black Elk, and so on. So the book must have required a phenomenal amount of historical research. And I'm wondering, how long did it take you to do the research on this book, and what motivated you to take on this very challenging writing subject? (laughs) Those are a couple of questions there. I wasn't logging in every time I you know, went to do the research on the book, so I have no idea. Um, uh, but the research it was long. I, you know, I went through hundreds and hundreds of books, and it was a bit like mining for gold, um, panning for gold, actually, just you know, searching through lots of books that had nothing, and occasionally there would be a book that had a little golden nugget. Um, but the process um, was also guided in a way. Um, for example, um, there are books that kind of deal with this sort of experience. And so starting with those books, I could find leads, I could network through those books to others and eventually find more golden nuggets. But your original question was what what motivated the research? And um, of course, a lot of people ask that. And I remember shortly after I learned Transcendental Meditation many years ago, and of course, when you learn Transcendental Meditation, right from the beginning, you learn about higher modes of human development or higher states of consciousness, as as Maharshi describes them. Uh, You learn about Transcendental Consciousness, which is the state of just eyes closed, deeply inward meditation of the mind moving, settling inward beyond thought, beyond perception, beyond memory to just a state of wakeful silence. One one learns about that early on in uh, the instruction in Transcendental Meditation, and one has experiences of that, however fleeting they might be early on. And so that's, you know, that's fascinating to consider that beyond our familiar states of waking, dreaming, and sleeping, there might be an altogether distinctive state of consciousness that that I found just completely fascinating. We don't usually think of the fact that in a 24 hour daily cycle, we are rotating through three very distinctive states of consciousness. Physiologists may study that and psychologists to some extent, but as ordinary people, 
we, we go to bed at night, we have deep sleep, we have some dreams, but we don't think that these are states of consciousness, meaning unique modes of knowing ourselves, unique modes of knowing the environment around us. We don't think about it. So the fact that there could be some fourth state, and what is that? That, that was fascinating. And then also early on, one learns about a fifth state of consciousness, which we can talk about in more detail later. And then a sixth and a seventh state of consciousness that that Maharshi predicts. So pretty quickly, we find out um, that Maharshi has put forward an understanding of human development that goes way beyond the normal model that we have in, say, Western psychology. Um, In that normal model, human beings develop through childhood. There are significant stages of development in childhood. They reach adolescence. And as far as modern psychology is concerned, then it levels off age 15, 16, or 17. Now, of course, we learn more, we gain more skills. If we're lucky, a few of us may gain some wisdom. But as far as what they call momentous human development, significant new stages of growth, it pretty much levels off. So here again, the idea that there could be stages of development beyond uh, what we ordinarily experience and take for granted, that that to me is just fascinating. And I don't know why it's not completely fascinating to everybody else. So those were initial impulses. And of course, coming into transcendental meditation, I was looking for something more, as so many people are. You know, you just I heard from my father when I was young that this old kind of cliche by now, but you know, at age 11, when my father said to me, you know, scientists estimate we just use a small part of our full potential, I thought, what? Even then, I, I didn't know the term cognitive dissonance, but that's what I experienced. Like, how can these two things be true, that we have this potential and we don't use it? You know, how, how can those coexist? And I remember making a vow to myself, I'm going to be different. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to put myself on some kind of, and I didn't know what that would look like or even be. Um, So this is all setting the stage for learning TM and then learning it. And then as for the initial seed impetus for the book, I, I remember that I had been meditating for a couple of years and somebody, I don't know who, or somehow some piece of paper with four lines of poetry on it, if if I can remember correctly. Maybe they were from Wordsworth. Whatever the lines were and whoever it was from doesn't matter. But what the lines were describing was evident to me that it was a description of the experience of transcending the fourth state of consciousness. And this from a person who would never have learned transcendental meditation. They lived hundreds of years ago, and they just wouldn't even be aware of this possibility. And yet here were these lines, which you look at them and you say, that's it. They're describing this experience of settled mind, deep physical relaxation and an expansion of consciousness. And I thought, wow, you mean there might be a person who even before Maharshi came along, even centuries before might have had this experience. And I suppose today, uh, because meditation is so much in the air and there's so many forms of human development and types of meditation. This may seem like a rather naive realization, but I had never considered such a thing. And um, I began to be on the lookout for those things. And you know, shortly after that, I came to MIU and I began to talk to other faculty members in philosophy or art. And I assumed that because they were also practicing TM, and that they were also aware of this model of higher states of consciousness in their own reading, they might have found some reference to an experience of a higher state, such as I had seen on this piece of paper. And sure enough, they had. So I began collecting these. This this began my journey of panning for gold and um, went from there. I'm wondering if, if when doing the research, if it wasn't a bit of a revelation in some ways, because... Traditionally, many of us have thought of enlightenment as something very difficult to attain, something one works towards for years and years and requires arduous practice and asceticism. And then your research has revealed that these experiences of higher states of consciousness have existed throughout time 
throughout history, around right. the world, and in every culture. And was that yes. somewhat of a revelation for you? It was a confirmation of, a, of a, something that I felt deeply. And in fact, you can take Maharshi's model of seven states of consciousness, four of them being higher states of consciousness, you can take that as a prediction. He, de he describes them as natural states of consciousness. They're natural stages of human development. And so if that's true, then, then we could imagine, we could turn that into a, a scientific prediction, if you will, that if that's true, then we should be able to find them recorded through history. They might be rare or not, we don't know, but we should be able to find them. And so I'd already had some little bits of evidence that intrigued me and that seemed to suggest that the prediction would be confirmed. Um, but as I went forward and continued accumulating and eventually amassing collections of these, then, then the prediction was confirmed. And what was especially pleasing to me was that there was there were descriptions of experiences that exactly matched each of the four higher states of consciousness. That we might call a, a revelation. I, I might not have expected that. But um, in fact, Maharshi's model of seven states gives a kind of metric or a touchstone or um, a means of assessing unusual experiences. And of course, from today backwards through all of history, there are all sorts of unusual experiences that ha people have mentally and psychologically. And Marshy's model enables you, first of all, to filter out experiences that don't qualify as higher states, and then to assign them to the most likely category. Is it the fourth state, transcendental consciousness, or the sixth state, God consciousness? So there was support for the prediction that these are found through history. And then again, multiple, multiple collections of experiences that match each of the four higher states, sometimes even using the exact phrases or very similar phrases to the um, phrases Maharshi himself uses to describe. So these experiences, as they occurred around the world and throughout time, clearly these people came to it through a variety of means, or some of them utterly yes. spontaneously. Yes, so both. although transcendental meditation, certainly the most well-documented tool for quickly developing <laughs> consciousness, right. it's also a natural phenomenon in some ways, because right. what we see is that it occurred long before the advent of, of transcendental meditation as we know it. So there right. were, it may have been under a different name, it may have been a slightly different practice, but something right. existed throughout time. Wouldn't that be correct? Well, in some cases, it's clear if you take somebody like the Buddha or Lao Tzu or some of those ancient figures, uh, even in even ancient, um, you know, Greek philosophy, but especially in the East, it's we can imagine, we can assume that they had some sort of meditative practice that, that they were familiar with. That would be one category. But there are others for whom the experiences of any of the higher states of consciousness come about completely spontaneously. They're not looking for them. They're not, they may not be spiritually inclined. They're not seekers. And yet here comes this experience and it's, it's revelatory. Like, wow, what, what is this? Uh, and again, people describe it in beautiful language and, and often they'll say it's, it was so simple when it came, it was so natural. I realized, I'm paraphrasing multiple people here, but they'll say things like, I, I realized that this was the real reality, or I feel like I've awakened from a kind of sleep. And then the experience goes away. And they say, how do I get that back? Or but, that, that, that moment in my life is the touchstone by which everything else in my life is measured, you know, that, those few moments in time. Um, it's like that. In your book, you have a quote from William James, and the quote you put was, he said, compared with what we ought to be, we are right. only half awake. Yeah, exactly. So hence the title, The Supreme Awakening. And in, in multiple traditions, people talk about, you can use the word spiritual growth or spiritual development or whatever you care to use, it's often cast in terms of awakening. Of, of becoming more awake. 
Um, and when people have that experience, then they look at their ordinary waking state experience and they describe it as a kind of sleep or some kind of lethargy, like now I'm truly awake. One other thing that I found that I'd like to mention is that as I began accumulating these things, I had a position in the university. I was dean of students. And so I thought um, it would be a really nice service to provide students and all the members of the community to have a little newsletter about what's going on, just to keep people informed about what's happening. And once I started that, then I thought, well, you know, I've got all these experiences and it's going to be years before I get a book written. I'll just start publishing one of them as a little corner of a page and in every issue. And, and when I did that, so many people came and, and thanked me for that. And like, wow, that was great. And th these are so fascinating. And um, it was very gratifying, of course, and it was maybe not surprising, but it was really pleasing. And what I realized is that one reason people resonate with these is that it just confirms for them that what we're talking about through the experiences that we have in our own TM practice is that this is not this is not like a Vedic experience. It's not an Indian experience. It's not even a Maharshi experience. It's a universal human experience that people have described for you know forever. And not that people ever had any who read the things that I was publishing, not that they had any question about that, but just to have that affirmed and to see it reflected in the experiences of people from, you know, 18th century England or 600 BC in China or um, like that, just all over the world, just to have it confirmed that it's universal, that really, it was intellectually satisfying, but there was some kind of emotional heart response too that I found interesting. And it was just, it was gratifying for me to see that, that people really resonated with these things. And since I've published my book, I that's the kind of feedback I've had just over and over and over again from so many people. It's it's tremendously gratifying. Right. I, I, I see what you mean. I mean, the experience being universal, but often the language or, or, or descriptions yeah. may vary. Like, for example, uh, moksha, nirvana, yeah. enlightenment, right. liberation, right. cosmic consciousness, <clears throat> self-realization. All these terms actually are just different names for the same experience, are they not? Yeah, that, that's right. And um, for academics in the crowd, I might add that, of course, you know, there are legions of modern scholars who probe into the writings on these things. And, and they'll, they may disagree with what you just said, or they may disagree that um, St. Teresa of uh, Avila was describing the same thing as, you know, the Buddha a couple thousand years earlier. Um, and, but this is all analysis from an intellectual level without necessarily having had the experience. And, and that's really the, the main point here, that these people have described these experiences in very similar terms throughout history. People of widely separated cultures, widely separated time and distance in very similar terminology. And that the experiences that people have through their transcendental meditation practice you know, they're not they're not the Buddha. They're not some genius of philosophy in ancient Greece. They're not some great explorer or painter. They're just an ordinary person who picked up this technique. And they describe experiences that you can put side by side with the experiences of Wordsworth or Tennyson or anybody. And they stand right up there alongside them. So just ordinary people practice a technique. And what comes out? the same kinds of experiences that have been described by some of the great geniuses through history. And that's another thing that people found gratifying, that now we have just an effortless technique, as you said earlier, that we don't have to leave this type of experience to chance. Um, it doesn't have to be a once in a lifetime thing or a three times in a lifetime. It, we don't leave it to chance. We just can have that experience every day, twice a day. That's such a good point because this is somewhat of a recurring theme when we read about the people who've had these experiences that did not have a technique to repeat the experience, that having had the experience, it's often followed by a period of intense longing, a, a, yes. almost a kind of a suffering to be without the experience and not be able to get it back. And, 
I, just in that vein, I had I had pulled out a quote that has uh, interested me for years, and I thought it would be relevant. This is from uh, the famous American playwright Eugene O'Neill yeah. from his autobiographical play *Long Day's Journey Into Night*, and I'd just like to read this and hear your comment on it. He said, "No, yeah, great." I dissolved in the sea, became white sails and flying spray, became beauty and rhythm, became moonlight and the ship and the high dim starred sky. I belonged without past or future, within peace and unity and a wild joy, within something greater than my own life or the life of man, to life itself to God, if you want to put it that way. Then the moment of ecstatic freedom came, the peace, the end of the quest, the last harbor, the joy of belonging to a fulfillment beyond man's lousy, pitiful, greedy fears and hopes and dreams. And several other times in my life, when I was swimming far out or lying alone on a beach, I have had the same experience, became the sun, the hot sand, green seaweed anchored to a rock swaying in the tide. Like a saint's vision of beatitude, like a veil of things as they seem, drawn back by an unseen hand. For a second you see, and seeing the secret are the secret. For a second there is meaning, then the hand lets the veil fall, and you are alone, lost in the fog again, and you stumble on toward nowhere for no good reason. Oh my gosh, that is just superb. And after all of my thousands of hours of panning for gold, Ron, that beautiful, huge golden nugget eluded me. This is the first oh, time I've Oh, you're kidding. I no, I haven't. <laughs> Wow. Uh, this, this inspires me to put out a new edition of the book, literally, to oh, include uh, that jewel. That is fantastic. Yeah. It, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful description of the experience and of the anguish that followed not yeah. being able to repeat it. And there, I think, we have the value of a repeatable technique. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I just want to appreciate, you know, I just was jotting down a few phrases right at the beginning. He says, dissolved in the sea. And that's just a classic metaphor that the that consciousness is is like a sea. That's a, a a frequent analogy that Marshy himself uses. The mind or consciousness is like a sea, and normally we experience only the surface, only the the wavy waves on the surface, waves being akin to our thoughts and feelings and perception. And so he dissolves in the sea. It's it's just a vision of like the 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 limited localized egoic self you know just transcending itself and dissolving in in pure consciousness and and he talks about becoming peace he doesn't say i experienced peace i experienced unity i became peace i became unity and and toward the end there was a marvelous phrase i just this is like so i'm so it's just so wow toward the end there was that phrase and seeing the secret you are the secret. And it brings out a really profound and, and subtle understanding of what it means to transcend, what it means to experience silent inner awareness. And, and often we'll say, well, I experienced transcendental consciousness. And just in the grammar of that statement, it's like I, on the one hand, experienced transcendental consciousness. Well, it's not like that at all. In the experience of transcendental consciousness, there's no I that's experiencing something else. It's more precise to say, it, in that moment, transcendental consciousness experienced itself. Pure consciousness experienced itself. It's not I and then over against that something else. It's just the wholeness of unified consciousness awake within itself. There's that expression from the Upanishads, I think, the knower of Brahman becomes Brahman. In fact, that's the only way you can know and experience your own innermost self, which is unbounded, is to become it, because it's unbounded. Something that's limited can't exper fully experience something that's unlimited. Only something unlimited can experience the unlimited, and there's only one of those unlimiteds, and that's just the unlimited 
you know, ocean of pure consciousness. And there's one, anyway, Eugene O'Neill, kudos to him um, for having the experience so clearly and, and expressing it so poetically. Life itself, he called it. This is another common theme that people will say, um, like in there's a passage that I quoted in my book from the poet William Wordsworth. So at the end, he said, in this experience, we see into the life of things. Just the, the the sense, and you see it over and over again, that people feel in these moments, it's somehow truth. This is the truth. This is the, like I said before, this is the real reality. Different words for it, but they're all trying to use language with all its limits to capture something that's beyond language. And they call it the truth. They call it wisdom. They call it reality. Um, Eugene O'Neill, life itself. Even he said, we might call it God. And people do call it God sometimes. That doesn't mean it's a religious experience. It just means they are looking for the highest and most powerful and exalted word that they can find in their language to describe what they're experiencing. And for people, especially those of a religious background, they'll just come out and and call it God. And I think I think may... because because otherwise they have no description for it. It's an indescribable right. experience. It's That's beyond it. language. Right. So let's call it God. Yeah, that's right. And and that can cause no end of confusion among people who think that they know what God is or think that God is only accessible through their tradition or um, think that it's blasphemy. To But religious figures in every tradition are, are describing it and non-religious too. And it just shows you that, yes, this is, this kind of experience, the experience of any of the higher states, the, but particularly the fourth state, particularly the experience of transcending, this is the core experience of every religious and philosophical tradition. And there are scholars and others who may take issue with that, but that was something I became absolutely convinced of. Um, and you know, we're not talking about some intellectual idea that you can dissect and pick apart. Um, like operating on a, a butterfly or something and and destroying it in the process of the, it's it's an experience and it has to be known through experience. The intellectual understanding is is valuable, important, it's vital, but it has to be known through experience. And then when you have the experience, a lot of these sort of intellectually constructed understandings kind of melt away. You realize, yes, they are talking about the same thing, no doubt. And and speaking of Wordsworth, because that you have his that poem in your book, and it really struck me. I'd mm. like to just read it for those of our listeners that haven't actually read it or heard it. Uh, what you're referring to when you say it, we see into the life of things. These were from his very famous poem, lines written a few miles above Tintern Abbey. He says that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. And I mean, he uses the word we are laid asleep, but he means clearly asleep in body, meaning there's a, a very deep and profound stillness, but obviously not sleep because he's having this experience of, of pure awareness at the same time. Absolutely. Those lines are so beautiful. I've read them. I've read them out loud hundreds of times, and they move me to the same extent every single time. Read that line again. It's right in the middle, the breadth of this, uh, of our, the corporeal frame lines. Until the breath of this corporeal frame, and even the motion of our human blood, almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. Right. So even the motion of our human blood and even the becoming suspended there, 
it's just a, a remarkable, it's almost like he's a physiologist, um, awake to the changes taking place in his, hum, in his own body. He's uh, that breath almost suspended. Of course, we have multiple studies showing um, slowing of breath rate during TM practice and even periods of natural breath suspension during the practice. And what's unique about those periods of breath suspension is there's no what they call compensatory after breathing. It's not like you're holding your breath and then ah, ah, like afterwards, it's just this natural breath suspension. And so it's remarkable that Wordsworth would pick up on that and the, the, the motion of our human blood even. And again, that we could line that up with studies on the slowing of the heart rate. So just metabolic rate, every measure that scientists look at in the human body during TM practice, they find deep rest, whether it's in the metabolic rate of the red blood cells or the, you know, the activity of muscle tissues um, throughout the body, deep rest and Wordsworth, Wordsworth gets that. And then that phrase, we're, we're laid asleep in body and we become a living soul. So we have a term that, you know, those of us uh, practice TM are familiar with, restful alertness. Restful alertness, two words that characterize the fourth state of consciousness. Restful referring to the body, alertness referring to the mind. So when Wordsworth says we're laid asleep in body, there's the restful and we, be, we become a living soul. There's the alertness. And it's, I just marvel at that. And just such simple words, and they're so deep and moving. And what strikes me also is that Wordsworth, a, a, a poet, and uh, Einstein, a scientist, and uh, an author, uh, Emily Dickinson, normal people throughout society having this experience, unstrived for, uh, without a, any particular repeatable practice experiences, right. and what, and all different religions. So what it tells me is that it's not a philosophy, it's not a religious, right. it's, it's something that is a natural part of human evolution, human life. Absolutely. Another thing that struck me as I was doing the research for this book was again how in every tradition, people not only had this experience, but they prized it, they cherished it, they went after it. They devoted their lives to having this kind of experience. Right, right. Of course, in the East, you know, people will be familiar with the notion of ashrams and so on. You retire into the ashrams or these days, almost everybody is familiar with the idea that, especially in the mysterious East, people will just retire from society and live a reclusive life, live in caves or the wilderness or whatever, trying to shut out any kind of distraction any kind of impediment to having just the pure experience. But even in the West, we have the example of <clears throat> the Desert Fathers in Egypt and, and the Eastern Mediterranean, just again, retiring into the desert, trying to peel away any sort of outer impediment, um, any kind of thing in society, any kind of disturbance or distraction to try to have this experience. There's a whole contemplative tradition in the Catholic Church, of course, of co convents and monasteries and so on. And w to the extent that they knew about this experience, they wanted it. And people would do, you know, they would go on fasts and purification regimens and do even sometimes strange things, you know, s sleeping on, you know, planks and, and fasting for days, just trying to somehow jolt the body into having some kind of experience outside the waking state of having this experience of transcendence that they may have heard about from their fellow seekers um, or read about in some, some scripture or something. So it's been the quest for millennia, um, a conscious intentional quest and all over the world, indigenous societies everywhere. And so there again, we're grateful to have now in the modern world, a technique for not having to do such arduous, impossible things to have the experience. We all experience that knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. What we experience in the waking state, we don't experience in the dreaming state or in the sleeping state. What we experience in the dreaming state, although it appears to be real, 
is, of course, not real. We discover when we're in the waking state of consciousness. And you point this out in your book, that, that knowledge is structured in consciousness, and knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit, because it's such a, a central point, because it really means everything that we know and experience and understand about life depends entirely on our own level of consciousness. Yes, and yeah, beautiful point, and it's, it's so profound. And as I was indicating earlier, we humans go through three different states of consciousness during the day without thinking much about it. I remember once I was, maybe this was a writing class I was teaching, or maybe it was a forest academy that I was leading or something, but I did an exercise with students and I asked them to imagine, just let your mind, no limits, just imagine the most different sort of world that you can from this world that we're living in, as different as it could be. And you can imagine what the students came up with. They were very creative, but they were all like, it's another planet or it's you know some other place covered with sand like dune or animals that could do this or like that. In other words, they came up with things that were different superficially, but they were all, I pointed this out to them, they were all just different versions of the waking state world. Nobody came up with something like deep sleep which is radically different than, than the waking state. Nobody came up with anything like dreaming, which is just completely different than either waking or deep sleep, deep sleep. And my point of the exercise was to drive home the fact that even in these three familiar states, they are so different from each other. You know, in the, what's our knowledge in the sleep state? We have no knowledge at all. And what's our knowledge in the in the dreaming state? As you you know were pointing out, it's something is happening, but it's illusory. And in the waking state, we finally there think that we have some version of reality. It's reliable. This is where we move around, but so radically different. And if we only had the waking state, let's say, let's say we were just born where there was only the waking state, how would anybody even imagine something so different as dreaming or deep sleep, without having had those experiences, you couldn't imagine that. And my point here is similarly, without having had the experience of the fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh states, you really can't imagine it. So in my book, you know, I might have included even a warning. The warning might say something like, you'll read these people's descriptions of their higher states, but don't, don't, don't fool yourself into thinking that now you know what it is. You know, don't think, all right, I, I got it. I got that. I can move on. Because some of the people themselves will say that their words don't do, dis, do justice to the description. I think it was Ionesco, Eugene Ionesco, the, the playwright who said, my words disfigure the, the actual experience. So um, this is a roundabout way of coming around to your point that the that knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. We know that from our experiences of waking, dreaming, and sleeping being so distinctive from each other. And the higher states of consciousness are equally distinctive. That doesn't mean they're some kind of, they're not, they're strangely different. They're not, they're very natural. When people have them, there's a kind of, as different as they are, there's a kind of familiarity, like down deep, I always knew, you know, some kind of resonance with it. So I'm not trying to say that the, you know, the experience of higher states is something like some strange dream or something. It's not. I'm only trying to say that it's just a different kind of knowledge. It's a different but altogether natural way of knowing yourself, who you really are. And as the higher states progress, a different way of knowing the environment around you what that environment really is. It's just a different mode of knowledge. Maharshi has a phrase, the seven worlds of the seven states of consciousness. So each state of consciousness is a world unto itself. And that's what I tried to do in the book, have enough experiences of each of the higher states that you enter that world. You don't just get a taste of it. You can spend time 
in that world of transcendental consciousness or in that world of cosmic consciousness and really steep in it as best you can through the words, but hopefully supplemented by your own meditation practice, your own TM practice to give some experiential foundation to what you're reading about in the books. Or, or whatever your practice may be. Yes. I, I, I mean, I remember <laughs> reflecting on that. I remember, and this is from my years as a teenager, so the memory is not perfect, but I remember reading a book on Zen Buddhism by D.T. Suzuki, and he right. talked about the state of enlightenment. He said, it's just like everything else. It's just like normal life, except you walk two inches above the ground. <laughs> Beautiful. So completely natural, completely normal, yet right. different, and, and in that freedom of enlightenment. Yes, and one thing that um, I wanted to complete a thought that I had, had started earlier, that when you, when you look back through history and you find in every tradition there are people who have just dedicated their lives to this quest, whether it's retiring from society into ashrams or mountains or forests or retiring into the deserts or in the case of Aboriginal Australians, just retiring from their tribe in the wilderness, just withdrawing. It just really struck me that this is the great human quest. This is it. This is what we're all about. This is what we are born to achieve. And some people are aware of that and being aware of it, they go for it based on whatever knowledge they have, whatever they know to do, whether it's retiring from the world or fasting or whatever it is, they just, they're so dedicated, they go for it. But even if you're not aware that this is what we're about, it is. And I think every most thinking people have some glimmering that there's more somehow to my life than what I'm living. There, there, there must be something more. There's just that little glimmering inside that sense, that little spark that says there is more. Maybe it's more in terms of how I, much I enjoy. Maybe it's more in terms of what I know about myself. Maybe it's more in terms of what I can meaningful, meaningfully achieve, not just through wealth and acquisition, but just a sense that there's more. And um, that goes to that basic principle that life, the nature of life is to grow. And we're born into the world not fully developed. And our purpose is to achieve that full development, that to fulfill the nature of life to grow, to grow to the ultimate, which is infinite. And we're capable of that experience. I think it's universal that we all want something more. We have, we strive for something more. We want more happiness and we think we'll get it through more physical material acquisitions or through more love or through whatever it may be. But there is a quest within the human spirit to find that fulfillment. And many who've studied this subject, and I think you would agree, would say, well, that, that is driven by the desire to come back to the self, back to the simplest state of awareness right. and really right. know that being that is that eternal freedom that is at the basis of our existence. That's such a beautiful phrase, the, the simplest form of human awareness. It's just the state of transcendence, the fourth state of consciousness, just the inward settling of the mind. There's nothing simpler, nothing more natural, nothing more intimate to ourselves than just that experience of our own self in its most settled state, nothing simpler or more natural. And that experience is the quest. And that becomes the foundation of the development of higher states. But it begins with that experience. And it is just universal. And even where it's not expressed explicitly, where people are talking about the experience, it's expressed implicitly. The, the whole quest archetype made famous by Joseph Campbell, it's, it's, a, it's a structure of narrative. It's a structure of mythology. It's a structure of story that somebody goes on a quest, and it's found in every tradition. Somebody goes out on a quest, leaves the familiar world, discovers a boon, and then brings that boon back to restore order to society. That is so universal. And it mirrors the exact structure of the process of transcending, 
We sit down, close the eyes, the mind settles inward. We leave the familiar world of the waking state. We go to an, an inner place, not the familiar outer world, but an inner place. We find our boon, which is the experience of transcending. And then we bring some of that value out. We bring out some of that, the peace from there, some of the creativity, some of the intelligence, uh, some of the unboundedness, expansion of awareness. So even in art like, like that, um, it's reflected. And whether the authors of those great epics that reflected the heroic quest, whether they knew what they were doing, whether they were calculatingly constructing a narrative to reflect that, it doesn't matter. Um, there's something in the dynamics of the mind that would be naturally reflected in the structure of, of literature. And so we, we, there's another way that we see it reflected in the world around us, whether people know it or not, there it is as some kind of subliminal reminder that this is why we're here is to have this and enjoy this and fulfill our life. That, that, that's a, 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 such an important point. And I, I'd like you to talk more about that because what comes to mind is, all right, we have the hero quest and we've all seen it and we've read the mythology and we've seen the spiritual ascetics who endeavor to better themselves through asceticism. We've seen the yogis perform amazing feats, but what, what, what I'd like to hear you speak about more, well, what about the ordinary man or woman, the ordinary person, the person down the street from me, right. they live their ordinary life, they're working, right. they're raising a family, they, they try to maintain a healthy and, and comfortable lifestyle. And their thinking is, well, I'm, I'm fine, things are okay as they are, why would I need to develop my consciousness? What, would, what does this higher states of consciousness have to do with me and my life? Um, do you want to live the fullest extent of the happiness that you're capable of? There's more. And probably those ordinary people these days are wondering, how do I get from out from under my anxiety? How do I get rid of my headaches? You know, how do I how do I cope in a world that seems to be coming apart? How do I do that? Well, it's the same answer to all the questions. Just come back to the simplest form of your own awareness. There's your anchor. There's your touchstone. There's the immovable rock within that without that, you know, the world can seem to be coming apart and we can feel like we're coming apart with it. And what do I have to hang on to? And, and you know, people turn to all sorts of things to try to find some sort of comfort from drugs, alcohol, whatever it might be, but the ultimate peace and comfort is within. And it's not just to have that experience, it's to cultivate it and make that the stable, ongoing reality of your life, that you never lose that experience of internal equanimity. The beautiful experiences in, in, in my book of that, of even in, even in dynamic activity, people don't lose that inner anchor, that inner bedrock of silent, pure consciousness, which is bliss. I mean, you're speaking about then the, the anxiety that people face in the world. And if nothing else, you know, this is a, a way to uh, directly address that problem and resolve it. And it, it reminds me of a, one of the comments I read about your book. One that really struck me was uh, it's by... Uh, is a comment written by Robert Stowe, PhD and executive director of Harvard Environmental Economics Program at the Harvard Kennedy School. I, I won't read the whole thing, but he, he said, in talking about your book, he said, we collectively face many seemingly intractable problems. The wisest and best intentioned among us have not been able to solve most of these. This book, your book, suggests that solutions may lie in a place we have neglected to look in cultivating enlightenment, the highest expression of our full potential on a widespread basis. The Supreme Awakening, your book, suggests that individual experience of higher states of consciousness on a much larger scale than has been possible in the past is the basis of a breakthrough in creating a better world. Drawing widely from world literature, P. 
Pearson offers examples of individuals who have experienced higher states of consciousness and fortunately recorded those experiences. This collection is a magnificent accomplishment in itself. We have read some of these passages before and they have delighted us, but they have left us asking how, if at all, we might cultivate these experiences, and which is something you go on to answer in your book. And how, how is the development of higher states of consciousness, as Robert Stowe suggests, going to help create a better world and resolve these very serious issues that we face in the world, these, as he says, intractable problems? That's a great question. Um, when we look around us and we look at the challenges that we're facing in the world, and certainly the climate crisis gets a lot of publicity, but there are many more. There's rising chronic disease around the world. There's the rapid collapse of ecosystems, um, the, you know, the warming of the oceans, the pollution of the environment, the rising toxicity due to the you know, tonnage of toxic chemicals that we pump into the environment every year. Wars ongoing, and conflicts. Wars and the ongoing threat of nuclear weapons and now the threat of chemical and biological and those types of weapons. Um, it's like, how far can we go before we actually annihilate ourselves? And, you know, we've really, the human, the human race is under just unimaginable pressure right now, really um, multiple challenges to, to our, our survival as a species. And I don't think anybody would say we're on track to, you know, to solving those. There are thousands, maybe millions of really good hearted people who are working to reverse climate change, to reduce the production of toxic chemicals, to work to, to reduce the severity of chronic disease, just good people in every sphere, but add it all up. And are we pulling back from the brink or not? I don't think any person would say that we are. And so, first of all, what is the source of all of these problems? Are we dealing them with dealing with them on their own level, or are we going to a deeper level? I would argue that the source of all of these problems, and they might seem so different on the surface, but ultimately the source is what we might call collective stress. And there's a very close parallel between the human body of the individual and the collective body or collective consciousness of, of people. And uh, this is a whole other topic where we get into, Ron, the discussion of the Maharshi effect and groups of people practicing and so on. Um, so not to go there necessarily, but to answer your question, what does this add to the picture? Widespread practice of transcending of transcendental meditation in particular, will unleash levels of creativity that we haven't had yet. What is a problem after all? A problem is just a situation to which sufficient creativity and intelligence have not yet been applied. When we apply sufficient creativity and intelligence to a, a problem and solve it, then it's not a problem anymore. So any problem, we just haven't brought enough creativity and intelligence to bear. It turns out we have wellsprings of creativity and intelligence that we have not tapped into. They can be cultivated. They can be brought to bear on the problems that we face. But there's something else, and it's even simpler than that, and that it, it turns out that stress and anxiety are contagious. So if you live, if you're a stressed person in a family, that contagion can spread to create stress in the whole family. If there are stressed people in the leadership of an organization, the whole organization will feel that stress and that anxiety. So that's contagious. And it's equally true that peace and harmony are contagious. And they're more powerful than stress and, and anxiety. So just by being peaceful within yourself, by cultivating that, you automatically become part of a solution rather than part of a problem. I, I like that. I, I mean, there is a difference, isn't there, between intelligence and wisdom. And what we see in the world, and I'm sure that you've reflected on this uh, for even more than I have, but what you see in world leadership in, in any field is there are lots of intelligent people, 
-hmm. there's not a great deal of wisdom being right. applied. Yes, yes, we uh, there's some phrase that goes to the effect that we have 21st century um, intelligence and technology and we have hunter gatherer. Um, you know, wisdom, we could say, you know, the hunter, I don't want to mean to disparage hunter gatherers, there is enormous wisdom among them, maybe more than we have today. But there's there's the point our, our technology isn't keeping pace with our, our wisdom and our capacity to use it wisely. Right. Right. But the but the simple point is when we when we're feeling it's so easy to read the news and feel helpless, what can I possibly do about the collapse of ecosystems? What can I do about nuclear weapons? Well, you can transcend. And every time you transcend, literally every time, multiple times during a meditation session, we transcend. Every time that happens, an impulse of peace and harmony goes into the environment, whether you're aware of it or not, whether you believe that that's happening or not, that's what's happening. There's a recurring sentiment. Um... As you mentioned that, that there's a recurring sentiment from great teachers that say when people come to them and talk about oh this calamity and that calamity, and very often these people who are considered to be enlightened teachers or fully realized, they almost universally will come back and say the best thing you can do to help the world is to develop yourself. That's develop right. your own consciousness. Why? Yeah. Why is that? Is that on what you're saying now on the enlivenment of that simplest state of awareness within yourself having yeah. a universal effect? That's it. That the yeah, that change begins within. Change begins. And you within. find that you find that yeah. from, you know, be the peace you want to see Gandhi, right? Uh, right. You want to see a peaceful world? Hmm. Be that peace, just be it and and it will spread by itself. Certainly, there's no Harm and advocate, just saying but... be the peace though it sounds so wishy-washy you know it's well it's a kind of platitude these days yes right if if you're aware of the experience of of transcending and the experience of higher states then you can unpack those simple words be the peace you want to see how do you be that peace yeah. you transcend to the field of perfect peace and you do it so many times that that perfect peace becomes the ongoing backdrop of every thought you have, of every word you speak. It, there's that lively peace that's infusing your words and your speech with that peace. And whether you're, even when you're not speaking, you are radiating peace into the environment. Right. I think that's so, the point, isn't it? It's, yeah, not, it's, a, it's not the intellectual thing, oh, be the peace. No, it's yeah. not the thought. It's that living that lively field is what creates the impact. Yeah, and you can't make a mood of that piece. You know, right. you can't make a you making a mood of it doesn't change the way your brain functions, but you can induce your brain to function in a more harmonious and literally peaceful way to radiate peace in the environment through through transcending. So that's where it starts. And just to echo what you just said, the most important the most valuable thing you can do for the world is simultaneously the most valuable thing that you can do for yourself and vice versa. At some point, I want to come back to some actual experiences from people that so we can. Well, we're we're totally in sync because that's just what I wanted to ask you. Uh, I wanted to ask if speaking of this higher states of consciousness, do you have some favorite uh, excerpts or quotes from the book that you would share that, oh, gosh. that clearly describe or depict what it means to be in higher states of consciousness? I could almost pick them at random. And I'll say that in the in the years of working on this, um, reading, take an example like Helen Keller, um, you know, famous in her time for being, you know, blind and deaf from birth. And I thought, you know, probably there's something there. Maybe there might be. So I read, I don't know, she's written 14 books. I read all of them. Again, panning for gold. And I just came to feel like I really knew Helen Keller. And so too, with so many other people, I just began to feel like these are my friends. You know, they're, I know them in a, in a deep way uh, on the level of this experience and even on the level of their lives, you know, just to compose those little blurbs that I did at the beginning of each one. Lots of reading to really just find out what is, do that as best as I can. So 
these people to me are are just like living today, living through their words. But one other experience I had that I wanted to share that will lead us to one of my favorite examples was Maharshi has that experience, that expression that what you put your attention on grows stronger in your life. So I remember one time I was at my wife's grandmother's house. She was in her 90s at the time, just a little house. And while my wife was visiting with her mother, I didn't have much to do. So I went upstairs and there's this little back bedroom and behind the bed, there's a little bookcase. And on the bookcase, there was a few dusty old books. And one of the books was entitled Adventures in Contentment. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. I'll, what's that about? And so I picked it up and opened it up. And immediately I found myself reading a description of transcendental consciousness. And the author was, the pen name of the author was David Grayson, who I learned was actually a, a man named Ray Standard Baker. And it just opened me into his whole world. Just, But there was this sort of accidental discovery. But the one that I especially wanted to focus in on, I remember one night I was eating my dinner and a Land's End catalog had just come in the mail. Land's End being a, a U.S. retailer of, of clothing and other supplies. And, and from time to time in a Land's End catalog, they might have a little insert, like they'll send a, you know, a photojournalist to some place where they've got, you know, fabrics for their clothes, just to give some little special interest to their catalog. So I'm just reading and, you know, not looking for anything. And so this particular <laughs> issue of the catalog was focusing on, on, on cashmere sweaters. That was what their feature was in the catalog. And the hair was coming from these goats in Mongolia. So they sent, uh, you know, they sent a journalist named David Yaden to Mongolia to do a feature article. And so I'm, this sounds interesting. I'll read this. And um, you know, I'm reading along. And I just want to read you what I read in this Land's End catalog. <clears throat> Let me just read this. It's a couple paragraphs. So he's, you know, this David Yaden, he's out there. He's with the Kashmir goats in Inner Mongolia. And here's what he writes. <clears throat> and over the slow, easy days, we watched and became part of the steady rhythm of their lives. I sat cross-legged on the ground while the goats were combed for their precious white cashmere fleece. And in the silences, my mind would fall silent and become as vast as the spaces around me. It seemed that everything I saw was actually within me, within an all-enveloping mind an eagle alone and soaring on spiraling air, a flash of light on quartz crystal, a wisp of wind rattling the grasses, the crack of rocks splitting into the dry, hard heat. I never sensed the power of silence so intensely. Each object seemed wholly distinct and full of individual energy, and yet so totally part of everything around me. And even my own body and spirit for fleeting but seemingly infinite moments became part of the land in the vibrant wholeness of this magic place. And so eventually we left, a lot more quietly and stilled in spirit than when we arrived. The herdsmen had allowed us to become part of their world for a brief period and to sense the slow, steady rhythms, the strong underpinnings of their lives. So. That's a description of unity consciousness in Maharshi's model, where he experiences everything around him as if a part of him, as a part of, as if within him, as if it still has its own individuality, but it's not separate from him any longer. He sees his self in what he's looking at. It's all unified on the level of, of consciousness. But this was in a Land's, Land's End catalog and just came to me haphazardly in the mail accidentally. So they're there. And when you're looking for them, they seek you out to, to paraphrase an expression. So that's, that's a favorite. And so I wrote to David Yaden to ask his permission. And um, he was happy that somebody noticed what he had written and picked up on that, that special thing. Um, that's, that's one example. Any others that you that stand out that you'd like to share? Because they're mm -hmm. they're just marvelous. The whole book is is just yeah. very inspiring. Um, there's one that I like a lot. Well, there's I mean it's a it's 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 difficult, but there's 
One of my favorites, I, I quote it all the time, and I'm gonna just quote it again because I love it so much, is by um, Billie Jean King. And let me find that here. Okay, so Billie Jean King, famous uh, American tennis player, considered one of the greatest tennis players, maybe one of the greatest athletes ever. I think she won more than 30 major tennis tournaments. Um, anyway, she, in her autobiography, she describes special moments out on the tennis court. And I'll break this into a couple of sections and then Ron, I'd like your reflections on them as we go through. She says, here she is, she says, on my very best days, I have this fantastic, utterly unselfconscious feeling of invincibility. I don't worry about how I'm hitting the ball and I hardly notice my opponent at all. It's like I'm out there by myself. I concentrate only on the ball in relation to the face of my racket, which is a full-time job anyway, since no two balls ever come over the net the same way. I appreciate what my opponent is doing, but in a very detached, abstract way, like an observer in the next room. I see her moving to her left or right, but it's almost as though there weren't any real opponent, as though I didn't know and certainly didn't care whom I was playing against. When I'm in that kind of state, I feel that tennis is an art form that's capable of moving both the players and the audience. When I'm performing at my absolute best, I think that there's that some of the euphoria that I feel must be transmitted to the audience. So that's that's part one. Did you what what stood out to you there? That that's fantastic. It's, it's an experience actually that tennis players call being in the zone. Right. And I'm sure other athletes uh, probably also have that experience of being in the zone where you're not really playing an opponent. You're just playing and everything is on automatic. Everything is working right. by itself. Everything right. is smooth. Everything is going as it should. You feel almost as if you could not make a mistake. And right. clearly, clearly Billie Jean King entered that state. And as that relates to higher states of consciousness, and this is more for you to comment on, but that, that would seem to be that through her activity, and she says, as an art form, and I'm sure tennis as an art form is applicable, but probably equally applicable to almost any discipline, whether it's painting or solving a mathematical equation. And that seems to be what Billie Jean King describes. Definitely an experience of the zone. And um, she checks off some of the key boxes. There's the euphoria, there's the peak performance, there's the sense that it's an art form. And in the middle of that passage, she had this phrase, I appreciate what my opponent is doing, but in a very detached, abstract way, like an observer in the next room. So like you say, everything is on automatic. And here's where she tries her best with words to capture the experience in a very detached, abstract way, like an observer in the next room. And for those listeners who are already familiar with Marishi's description of the fifth state of consciousness called cosmic consciousness, they'll know that they'll recognize that in that state, the mind is fully awake from the surface to the depth. And that depth of the mind is just pure silent, silent awareness, as we've been discussing through our conversation here. So in those moments, Billie Jean King's mind was just fully awake down to that silent transcendental field that's outside of all change, outside of the experience, actually. She's identified with the tennis playing on one hand, but on the other hand, she is just a transcendental, innocent observer or witness of what's going on. She's just literally from that deep level, that silent level, watching herself like an observer in the next room. Because that transcendental level, after all, it's, it's literally beyond space. It's beyond time. You can't reach in and poke it. You can experience it, but only by becoming it, as we've discussed. So that's what she's talking about. But then she, she takes it one step further. And let me read this one. And she really nails this point that I've just been emphasizing. She says, she's talking about not only the ideal game, but the ideal shot. 
So here she goes. The perfect shot is another matter. They don't come along very often, but when they do, they're great. It gives me a marvelous feeling of almost perfect joy, especially if I can pull one off on the last shot of the match. I can almost feel it coming. It usually happens on one of those days where everything is just right, when the crowd is large and enthusiastic and my concentration is so perfect, it almost seems as though I'm able to transport myself beyond the turmoil on the court to some place of total peace and calm. I know where the ball is on every shot and it always looks as big and well-defined as a basketball, just a huge thing that I couldn't miss if I wanted to. I've got perfect control of the match. My rhythm and movements are, in, are excellent and everything is just in total balance. That perfect moment happens in all sports. It's a perfect combination of a violent action taking place in an atmosphere of total tranquility. My heart pounds, my eyes get damp, and my ears feel like they're wiggling, but it's also just totally peaceful. And when it happens, I want to stop the match and grab the microphone and shout, that's what it's all about, because it is. It's not the big prize I'm going to win at the end of the match or anything else. It's just having done something that's totally pure and having experienced the perfect emotion. And I'm always sad that I can't communicate that feeling right at the moment it's happening. I can only hope that people realize what's going on. So three times in this rather short passage, she contrasts this, she she describes this kind of coexistence of opposite things, the dynamic activity along with silence. There's the one phrase where she says, I'm able to transport myself beyond the turmoil on the court to some place of total peace and calm. And where's the place of total peace and calm? It's inside. And it's always been there inside. The only difference is now she's awake at that level of deep inside of the transcendental level. Again, she says to emphasize the point, it's a perfect combination of a violent action taking place in an atmosphere of total tranquility. So during these periods, this is transcendence, it's unbounded awareness. So in this second pack passage from Billie Jean King, there are three different points at which she really emphasizes this seeming coexistence, uh, seemingly co I'm sorry, this coexistence of seemingly opposite values of activity and silence, outer activity, but undergirded by profound inner perfect silence. Um, one of the phrases is where she says, um, let's see, I'm able to transport myself beyond the turmoil on the court to some place of total peace and calm. And if we ask, where is the place of total peace and calm? It's, it's within, it's within the fully awake mind. And that place of total peace and calm was always there for Billie Jean King, always. It's just that she wasn't awake to it, that the mind wasn't fully awake. And in cosmic consciousness, the mind is fully awake permanently. It's the experience of transcendence. It's the meditative state along with dynamic activity. So beyond the turmoil on the court, that's there, but also there undergirding it is the place of total peace and calm. And then she echoes it again in another phrase. She says, um, my heart pounds, my eyes get damp, and my ears feel like they're wiggling, but it's also just totally peaceful. So there's dynamic physical activity, but totally peaceful. And like that, um, so it's a really classic description. Sometimes when I read this um, passage to audiences, I ask for a volunteer to count the number of times that she uses the word perfect in it. And then I ask for another volunteer to check the first person's work. And, and that always gets a laugh. But the point is, when I ask at the end, just in that short passage, she uses the word perfect seven times. So, you know, is, is there perfection in life? I, I think she'd say there could be, at least in special moments like this, when the mind is fully awake. It's like the perfect emotion, the perfect this, the perfect control of the rhythm and the match, the perfect everything. It's just perfect. And why? Because the mind is just fully awake. 
And that's what she says she feels invincible. As you said earlier, knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. Yes. And there is a state of consciousness in which things are perfect. In other mm -hmm. states of consciousness, we perceive a lot of imperfection and we right. live a lot of imperfection. But there is a higher reality in which everything is seen to be well and wisely put. Everything Beautiful. is just perfect as it should be. Yeah. Uh, I mean, tennis, she even says, tennis, this is true in other sports, she says. So tennis was her vehicle, but right. anything could be your vehicle to have that experience. And and as you said, she, she uses the word detached, and she was almost like an observer, and she was beyond the turmoil in the court. And, and this, if I can... Uh, interrupt your train of thought for one second, because oh. this really reminds me of a beautiful quote when of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, when he was asked about his enlightenment, his liberation, his moksha. And he said, I see as you see, hear as you hear, taste as you taste, eat as you eat. I also feel thirst and hunger and expect my food served on time. When <laughs> starved or sick, my body and mind go weak. All this I perceive quite clearly, but somehow I am not in it. I feel myself as if floating over it, aloof and detached. Even not aloof and detached, there is aloofness and detachment as there is thirst and hunger. There is also the awareness of it all and a sense of immense distance, as if the body and the mind and all that happens to them were somehow far out on the horizon. I am like a cinema screen, clear and empty. The pictures pass over it and disappear, leaving it as clear and empty as before. In no way is the screen affected by the pictures, nor are the pictures affected by the screen. The screen intercepts and reflects the pictures. It does not shape them. It has nothing to do with the roles of film. And he goes on to say, having realized that I am one with and yet beyond the world, I became free from all desire and fear. I did not reason out that I should be free. I found myself free unexpectedly and without the least effort. This freedom from desire and fear remained with me since then. Another, thing I, another thing I noticed was that I do not need to make an effort. The deed follows the thought without delay and friction. I have also found that thoughts become self-fulfilling. Things would fall in place smoothly and rightly. The main change was in the mind. It became motionless and silent, responding quickly, but not perpetuating the response. Spontaneity became a way of life. The real became natural, and the natural became real. And above all, infinite affection love, dark and quiet, radiating in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. Oh my and gosh. I, I, I love that. And again, it reflects much of what Billie Jean King and all the others have spoken about. And what I love about this quote especially is that it reveals, because to some people they think of aloofness or detachment, those are not desirable qualities. I want to be in life. I want to be part of life. This is how they feel. I want to feel that emotion, the passion. This is a new level of experience where life happens, and for the first time you can enjoy it fully because you're right. not overwhelmed by it. You can right. just experience and radiate that love, and that purity of love is something sublime, beyond the normal material experience. And I think that's what he brings out so beautifully in that quotation. And I've heard others speak of that too. Uh, there is some poem, 
I think it might be by Rumi, I'm not sure, where he talks about, it's a devotional poem to God, and he talks about, you know, you are the love that I feel. His realization that it's right. that experience of love is what his object of worship was. So in fact, there was no duality there. There was no object of devotion and devotion. The two were one, but it was that experience of that purity of that unbounded love and compassion is was in fact directed towards the object of devotion, which was itself. So it was like curving back on itself in a sense. Beautiful passages. And I have to, I just to, I'm amazed that those are new to me hearing them now. After after all of this searching where I thought I was really getting to the bottom of the barrel, I think the bottom of the barrel is endless, un, unfathomable in the number of things that we could find if we look. Um in that first one that you read, it was just textbook. It was just beautiful and poetic and that really conveyed the reality, this is cosmic consciousness of everything is going on as before, the thirst, the hunger, and so on. And yet, within it, as a backdrop, behind it, beneath it, however you want to say it, there is just the majestic, magisterial silence of the self, that lively, silent screen that now is open to my experience because my mind is fully awake. And that's who we all are. That's the inner reality of our own self. We are all that, that unbounded, perfect, eternal, unchanging, lively, blissful silence. That, that is our self. And it's not as though each of us has one of those. There is only one of those in the universe, and we are all just part of that. And that's who we are. And again, our, our destiny, our, our path, our journey, culminates in the experience of that and then the states that un unfold from that level. For every one of us on earth, that deep silence, it's there now, right now, whether you've experienced it or not, it's always been there and it always will be there. And our task is just to open the mind and experience it. And again, to, you know, it's, it's, I always, just to imagine that, you know, when, when, different people are closing their eyes to meditate and transcend. I'll just say this again. It's not that they're transcending into their own pure consciousness. These individual people of whatever different political persuasions that they might be, or ages, or ethnicities, or gender orientations, whatever those differences on the surface are, when they transcend, they are all going to the same single one ocean of pure consciousness that unites us all and of which we are all the reflections. That's what transcendence is. For those who've had that experience, it, it sounds almost cliche because I've, I've heard it and I've read it multiple times, but the reality is quite overwhelming in a delightful way. In, in the description, the way people describe it as being utterly familiar, completely familiar, and right. yet totally different, utterly different from our day to day. There's, it's something new. It's very much the experience of, oh, right. Yes, this is, of course, what the reality is. How has this eluded me until now? Yeah, How exactly. did I, I miss this? <laughs> exactly. Well said. One other point to add is that um, I just always, you know, when I speak with groups about this, I always want to make the point that these are beautiful experiences, and we don't want people to say, well, wait a minute, I'm not having that experience. You know, I, I haven't had the experience of Eugene O'Neill. I haven't had Billie Jean King's experience. Maybe a few people have, but our experience is our experience, and we don't want to go looking, you know, to inspect our ongoing experience to see whether this is coming. This is a point that, you know, as you know, Maharshi emphasizes, we should be innocent about our experience. We meditate, we act. It's fun sometimes to get together and contemplate these examples. But our own experience is, is our experience, and it's developing as it should, as it was meant to, provided the word transcending regularly. And it comes, it comes in time. It'll, it comes in due course. It unfolds gradually, naturally, in due course as our own particular 
constellation of stress and fatigue gets dissolved. And it, there are differences from person to person. So just, you know, for those of those people who might think, well, you know, what's happening to me? I'm not at the Billie Jean King level yet. Take take heart. It's coming. It's on the way. It, you have the advantage of developing this in a systematic way. Systematic means you're just systematically, regularly dissolving those clouds of stress that block the sun of that that experience. It's coming, and whether you are aware of it on a day-by-day -day basis or not, that light of pure consciousness within you is, is growing, and higher states are on the way. Craig Pearson, thank you so much for being on Simplest State. This has been an immensely enjoyable conversation. It's been delightful. I hope all of the listeners enjoyed it as much as I have. And I'm happy to tell everyone who's listening that uh, Dr. Pearson has five more books in the pipeline, <laughs> so we can look forward to much more enjoyable and profound reading by way of Dr. Pearson. Dr. Pearson, thank you again. Thank you, Ron. Wonderful to be with you. Wonderful topic to contemplate together. <laughs>